one of those pivotal moments in history where we're sure the international order is changing, even if we can't see clearly yet how it is going to change. We're in the midst of the first major war in Europe since World War II. It is a terrifying historical tragedy which has undercut the international order that all of us have known during our lives. And the war is brought to us every day in horrific detail and in an unprecedented visual way on television and in the social media. The war is a tragedy rooted in the delusional dream of one man, Vladimir Putin. He is obsessed with restoring the Russian Empire and eliminating the independent state of Ukraine. He has risked his rule and his legacy pursuing a dream fed by what I believe is a misunderstanding of history. Putin's world is a post-imperial world, a world where the clock has been turned back to a mythical era of Russian power. <clears throat> On July 12th of last year, Putin published an essay entitled On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians. In it, he questioned the legitimacy of Ukraine as a state and the current borders of the country. Now, that essay set off alarm bells among the Russian analysts in Washington and around the world when it appeared, because it sure seemed like the justification for a war to reclaim Ukraine. And that, of course, is exactly what happened. It's Putin's single-minded obsession to become one of what the Russians call gatherer of lands. That is, a Russian ruler who expands the boundaries and political influence of Mother Russia. Putin's become focused on Russian history in recent years, and he wants to establish a legacy as one of Russia's great rulers. Let me illustrate this with an anecdote. In April of 2014, a Russian company minted a limited edition one kilogram uh, silver coin, pretty big coin, to mark the annexation of Crimea, which had been, of course, the main object of Putin's first invasion of Ukraine in uh, February of 2014. The coin had Putin's face on one side, but a map of the Crimean Peninsula on the other, surrounded with the double-headed eagle emblem of Russia. The coin came to be known as the Gatherer of the Lands coin. It recalled the Tsar Rush Ivan III, who historians have named Ivan the Great, not to be confused with Ivan IV, who was Ivan the Terrible. Ivan III was the Tsar from 1462 to 1505. He consolidated power in Moscow, and then he attempted to conquer uh, Russian territories, such as Novgorod and Vladimir, before seizing territory in what is now Ukraine, Belarus, and Poland. This coin is emblematic of Putin's desire to go down in history as the fifth of the great Russian gatherers of lands. Ivan the Great, Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, Stalin, and now he wants to be. I think this is one of the conceits that, which is at the root of Putin's current approach. And the price of his hubris, of course, has been horrific. Every day, it's becoming clear that he's made a major strategic mistake. He miscalculated badly from the very start and simply didn't understand or want to understand that Ukraine was an independent, sovereign state. He did not want to understand that a strong national spirit had grown in Ukraine, that the Ukrainian people did not want to be a part of Russia. Nor did he take into account how the Ukrainians had prepared for the last eight years for war with Russia. Over the past eight months, the Russian invasion has been steadily reversed on the battlefield. The counter by an inspired Ukrainian army supplied with Western weapons and new military technology, as well as good intelligence. Today, the Russian military is on the defensive, trying to maintain their defensive lines. Hopefully, I'm sure they believe until winter sets in, when they hope the Ukrainian offensive operations will become much more difficult. On September the 30th, Putin made a speech, which I'm sure you read about, in the Kremlin, where I believe he crossed the proverbial Rubicon in several important ways. First, he announced the annexation of four regions, or oblasts, Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson. Russia, Russia held sham referendum, as you probably read in the paper, in each one of these oblasts, and surprise, surprise, it resulted in overwhelming numbers of people wanting to be a part of Russia. Apart from realizing part of his own dream to take over Ukraine, this decision now allows Putin to claim that this is a defensive war. In other words, territory which he has annexed 
which the which is partly uh, in the hands of, of the Ukrainians, and the Ukrainians are attacking and seizing more every day. This is now defensive territory. This is now Russian territory that we can now defend. Uh, it's Russian. Um, I think this also makes uh, negotiating a solution harder to accomplish. I'll come back to that in a minute. Second, Putin also announced on September 30th that he was moving to a partial mobilization. In fact, it looks like Russia is trying to call up more than the announced 300,000 men into the armed forces. Russia is desperate for replacement soldiers to counter the huge manpower losses that they have incurred. The British estimate that there are 85,000 Russian soldiers killed, wounded, or missing. You can see pictures in the press today of Russian authorities rounding up draft age young men on the street. Russia is so desperate that the authorities are now resorting to what almost looks like an impressment. Remember the British back around the time of the 1812 war went around and grabbed Americans on the street and put them on their ships and pressed them into service for the Royal Navy. It's the same kind of thing. This, of course, has led now ten to tens of thousands of young Russians fleeing the country to avoid being conscripted and said to die in Ukraine. I read this morning in the Moscow Times, they had a picture of a young attorney from St. Petersburg. 10 days ago, he was conscripted into the army. He reported for duty, and yesterday he died from the front lines of Ukraine. Ten days ago. Third, the September 30th decisions reflect a determination by Putin to hunker down and win what he sees as a war of attrition. The brutal Russian missile and drone barrage that we saw in the center of Kiev and other major Ukrainian cities this past week was designed both to terrorize Ukrainian civilians in the hopes of having them pressure their government to stop the war, as well as to destroy Ukraine's electricity, water, and heating infrastructure heading into what could be a cold winter. Fourth, since the Ukrainian armed forces are steadily pushing the Russian forces back, Putin's now decided to put greater pressure on the West to force Ukraine to stop the fighting. And here's where the threats of using nuclear weapons come in. I think Putin hopes that Western leaders will be so frightened they'll have the prospect of a nuclear weapon being used that they will lean hard on Zelensky to stop the military advance and return to the and go to the negotiating table. Putin's strategy of nuclear black. Two of my colleagues at the Rand Corporation, where I work part time, Rachel Cohen and John Gentile, recently summarized the significance of these decisions that Putin announced on the 30th of September as follows. And here I'm going to uh, read a quote Russia's partial mobilization in its sham referendums to justify the annexation of four provinces in eastern Ukraine create new sources of uncertainty about the future course of the war. Yet Russia's actions should also produce a moment of strategic clarity for Ukraine's partner, because no viable path to negotiated peace now remains. And any result short of Ukrainian victory will be, in the long run, a worse outcome for the international base, international rules-based order. I think the Biden administration and our European allies have understood this was the direction Putin was moving, and they've been planning, in fact, for some time for an extended war. This is why uh, the recent approval by the Congress of $40 billion for Ukraine was, was made because we thought this was going to take some time. From the beginning, Biden and leaders of NATO have seen the conflict as Putin's efforts to redraw the map of Europe and rewrite the international rules of the game. Western leaders have understood that the conflict is primarily about trying to destroy Ukraine and Ukrainian sovereignty and independence. But the impact of the crisis is international. Putin's invasion represents an attempt to undermine the European security system, which has given us decades of relative peace in Europe. The stakes for our international order couldn't be much higher. Now, understanding those stakes, the US and NATO members have provided billions of dollars and euros in weapons and economic support to Ukraine. At the same time, we refrain from engaging Russia directly to avoid an escalation into a wider war. Western leaders have taken strong public positions supporting Ukraine, including condemnation this past week by the G7 of Russia's annexation attempts and the horrific bombardment of Ukraine with cruise missiles and attack drones. The US and our allies quickly responded to the cruise missile attacks by promising to send more sophisticated air defense systems 
Ukraine. President Biden and European leaders have pledged to continue this supply as long as it's necessary for Ukraine to take back its territory. So now, what can we say so far about the broader impact of the war? I want to drill down a little deeper into some of these issues. I plan to look briefly in three areas. The impact of the war on the people and the economy of the region, the impact on the international economy and the international order more broadly, and finally, take a closer look at the impact of the war on the internal political situations inside of Ukraine and Russia. Now, we watch every day on television the heart-rending story, the horrible loss of life in Ukraine, both among soldiers and innocent civilians. There seems to be no limit to the readiness of Putin's army to kill the very people who Putin has called Russia's Slavic brothers and sisters. Time and again, we watch Russian forces attack not military targets, but apartment blocks, theaters, schools, and civilian infrastructure. The UN says rape and torture are weapons commonly used by Russian soldiers against Ukrainians. Ukrainian children, I'm sure you've seen the stories, are being kidnapped and sent back to Russia. We do not know at this point, of course, how many people have died in the conflict, and the numbers, of course, can't convey the depth of human suffering, as I said. When my wife and I left Moscow five years ago, over 13,000 people had already been killed in Donetsk and Lubansk, the Donbass. As I mentioned, the British now estimate 85,000 Russian soldiers killed, wounded, or missing. Ukraine has admitted some time ago the 9,000 soldiers killed. The Ukrainian numbers are certainly now much higher. Ukraine has lost control of 20% of its territory. It's had 30 to 40% of its economy destroyed. The destruction of Ukraine is conservatively estimated at $113.5 billion. And it, estimates are now that it'll take $200 billion to rebuild the country's damaged public infrastructure. 6.6 million Ukrainians have been displaced by the war, either internally or externally. Many are still residing outside of Ukraine in Europe, the U.S., or in Israel. They're not in refugee camps, but are being housed in homes with families. As I was saying at the dinner table, it's really a tremendous thing when you think of the Polish families. You know, they're not putting them in camps. They're taking them all into their homes. It's an amazing sacrifice. As many of you know, thousands of Jewish citizens of both Ukraine and Russia have fled their homes in fear, many of them now living in Israel. The most recent numbers I have seen were over 23,000 Jews have left Russia, including my friend, the chief rabbi, and his wife, uh, Pinkas Goldschmidt. Over 13,000 members of the Ukrainian Jewish community have also reportedly left. Now, these numbers uh, predate the outflow of many Russians after Putin declared the mobilization, so the numbers are probably considerably higher than that. I feel this loss with a sense of personal regret because I worked very hard during my time in Ukraine and Russia to support the rebuilding of the Jewish communities in both countries. Now, some of my friends tell me the economic impact on the average Ukrainian often gets missed by the media. People are suffering every day, and keeping the economy is running is a monumental task. We're providing $8 billion in balance and payment support, and the IMF and Europe are each contributing substantial amounts. Ukraine's bondholders have put a moratorium on the collection of their debt, substantial debt, but no one really knows at this point how Ukraine will cover its loans in the future, let alone rebuild when the fighting does come. Not only has Russia suffered substantial losses on the battlefield, but the Russian economy is also being hit increasingly hard by Western sanctions. Russia has some excellent macroeconomic managers who've done well mitigating the war's impact on Russia's financial position, but they cannot prevent the slow and steady erosion of the Russian economic position over time. Sanctions do take time to have an effect, my Russian friends tell me that they are having an impact on everyday life in Russia. By almost all accounts, the economy will erode in the years to come. I think in particular, the sanctions on computer chips and other high-tech products, which are so critical for modernization, will have a particularly deep effect on Russia. Russia will, in fact, fall even further behind the modern world in technological development. The Russians say that their GDP is going to drop by 2.7% this year. International estimates, I think, are still higher, more likely around 5%, and increasing in uh, the out year. 
As we all know, the effects of the war haven't been confined simply to Russia. The war has had global implications. The OECD recently wrote that despite a boost in activity as COVID-19 infections drop, global growth is projected to remain subdued in the second half of 2022. I'm quoting here. Before slowing down to even further to 2023, so that you'll have an annual growth rate of just 2.2%. Compared to the OECD forecast from December of 2021, before the war, Russia's before the before Russia's aggression, global GDP, GDP is now projected to be at least 2.8 trillion dollars lower in 2023. Staggering number, but it's such indicative of how this war has contributed to the economic problems that we have. Now we've seen the Russian blockade of Ukrainian ports in the Black Sea has led to a serious international food crisis particularly in the developing world. The world has grown dependent, as we've all seen, on Russian and Ukrainian grain in these recent years. Now, before they agreed with the UN and Turkey to negotiate a new export regime allowing the Ukrainians to export uh, the grain that they had stored from last year, not to mention sending out the grain that they're, they've been harvesting this summer, the AP reported that the Russians stole somewhere in the vicinity of $500 million the international damage, of course, isn't just economic. Putin has undermined the rule-based system, which I mentioned before. This broadly preserved European peace since World War II, and it really brought the continent decades of stability and prosperity, which, of course, is in our interest, given our own economic trade with the EU and Britain. Uh, it's really critical. When Putin first invaded in 2014, he took Crimea, subverted the Donbass, that in itself was a violation of all kinds of international treaties. It violated Ukraine's right, guaranteed under the UN Charter of Sovereignty and Territorial Integrity. By using force to try to change this border, Putin broke one of the key rules which has maintained peace in Europe for many decades. It prevented irredentist struggles over common health lines. Secretary General of NATO has said that Russia's war is a clear violation of the UN Charter, not to mention the commitments Russia has made over the last uh, five decades for European and uh, European peace, but also commitments they made directly to Ukraine. Russian violations of human rights and the commission of war crimes have rightly earned international condemnation. Now, I think we've all seen that Russia has become something of a pariah. China and India in particular took a kind of neutral position at the very beginning of the war. I think if you watch carefully, uh, particularly when you watch Putin with President Xi and with Prime Minister Modi at the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement Summit last month, you could see these guys beginning to feel very uncomfortable with this. And they were hoping for a short war. They were hoping this would be done, that it would not impact their interests. This last week, Modi made a particularly clear statement, I thought, showed that he feels his interests in India are being harmed by the Russian continued assault and killing of all of the Ukrainians. Because both India and China have their own interests, economic and trade, with Ukraine, and this is very good with them as well. Let me look a little bit more at the impact of the war inside Russia and Ukraine and the prospects for the future. Ukrainians have amazed the world with their military skill and organization taking on and rolling back the Russian invasion. I think we've all been impressed with the leadership which President Zelensky has shown during the past seven months. Every day, every day, he has rallied the people of Ukraine and Ukraine's friends in the world with Churchillian-style courage. He's an extraordinary communicator. That said, I think Zelensky's true test is still ahead of him. The war, as we know, is far from over. Even if Ukraine is successful on the battlefield, and even with massive international assistance, rebuilding the country will be a massive challenge. Zelensky and his government will have other tough choices to make when the fighting stops. It's hard to envisage just now just how that will end, but Zelensky and his team could face difficult choices about territorial compromise and the prioritization of Ukraine's means. Zelensky will have to deal with the plight of Ukrainian citizens who, under Russian occupation, cooperate with the occupation forces. 
then there are the array of domestic issues that were effectively put on hold, frozen when the war broke out, including Zelensky's competition with former president of Ukraine, Petro Poroshenko, who was, right before the war, being controversially charged with treason by Zelensky's prosecutor general. Now, the other big factor that's there is corruption. Ukraine has always suffered since 1991 from huge corruption. And this could become a big figure, a big factor again, when reconstruction assistance starts to flow. And then finally, there are the Ukrainian oligarchs. Before the war, Zelensky was pursuing a de-oligarchization campaign. Say that when it comes to the world. Uh, to reduce the power of the oligarchs over Ukrainian politics and the economy and their control of many pieces of the media. I think looking at Russia, the future is even harder to predict. And that's partly because unlike during the Soviet period, when I first started working on Russian affairs, then you had a Politburo. And you could stop and you could actually figure out after the Politburo meeting the next day, you could kind of cool, figure out which faction in the Politburo, which member got his way, which one didn't. This is criminology. You know, my friends in the Foreign Service who became true experts at that. You can't do that anymore. Because now you only got one guy. And he doesn't even tell his closest friends <coughs> and uh, colleagues what he's doing, let alone show up. <coughs> The Russian political analyst Tatyana Stanovaya has recently written that the Russian elites are now starting to admit the possibility of defeat. Stanovaya has recently written in Foreign Affairs magazine that Putin's annexation of Ukrainian lands and the domestic mobilization of soldiers is raising the possibility that Putin's strategy will lead to an apocalyptic end game inside Russia. Putin spelled that one out. She's the first one to tell us. She wants to the first one to tell us that it's moving in that direction. John McLaughlin, the former deputy director of the CIA, longtime Russian analyst, recently wrote that there's now no question that Russia could lose this war. In addition, McLaughlin argues that it's no longer unthinkable that Putin himself could lose power in the event of catastrophic outcome for Russia in Ukraine. Why is Putin going down this road? Why has he risked the very stability that he nourished during the 20 years he was in power? I think he grew frustrated with the repeated efforts to force Ukraine to cede it, with his repeated but failed efforts to, to force Ukraine to cede its sovereignty as a nation. Restoring Russian lands has become his life's work, his demonic dream, as I said earlier. And I think he also misjudged the West. He thought political divisions in the US and in Europe, in COVID, and other factors would somehow prevent us from responding. It would undermine our resolve. Now that he's in the war, all of his instincts, especially the tough lessons he learned as a young man on the mean streets of Leningrad, all of these tell him to hang in, double down, don't quit. And that's what I think we're seeing. Putin's also an agreed man. He has a huge chip on his shoulder toward the West. He blames us for the demise of the Soviet Union, which you'll remember he famously greatest political catastrophe of the 20th century. He's always believed that the U.S. is trying to destroy the Russian state. He thinks that this current war is run in Washington, and that only Washington can tell Zelensky and the other Ukrainian leaders to stop. I think he'd love to strike a deal with the U.S. to impose a settlement on Ukraine. I don't think that's feasible, number one. The Biden administration has said it's not in the cards in any way. Putin hopes that the cutoff of energy supplies to Europe not to mention the higher prices caused by the recent OPEC decision, that will be caused by the recent OPEC decision, will cause widespread public anger, particularly in Europe this year. I think it's important to remember, though, that that's really a short-term strategy. Putin's war has seen Europe's imports of Russian gas 
former veterans or conservation young men and their family who might be called up for the front. The Washington Post reported, I think this past week, that the U.S. has intelligence evidence that a senior member of Putin's inner circle recently went to him directly to voice his disagreement over his handling of the war. I suspect that the divisions in the elite and in Russian society more generally will only grow deeper as the impact of the mobilization and sanctions will affect more and more Russians. As we've seen in the press, tens of thousands of Russian men have now fled the country rather than being conscripted to fight and die in the war that they don't believe in. Even before the war, we saw a brain drain. When I was ambassador, from 2014 to 2017, I saw all kinds of young Russians escaping the Silicon Valley and a lot of the European IT centers not just because there was a job there, but because they didn't believe in the future of Russia. More broadly, after months of trying to isolate this special military operation, as he called it, keeping it out of sight, out of mind, it wasn't on TV, just, you just pretend you go about your business and we'll handle this little operation over in Ukraine. That's not him, him. Because every man on Russian TV, his right-wing critics are going out there and blasting the army and the defense minister, complaining that they have not prosecuted this war correctly. I think, in short, the cost of the war is striking home all across Russia as well. All right, so now you're probably asking yourself, okay, let's talk this long. Is there any chance this war can be brought to an end? And if so, how? And the short answer is, I don't think. Uh, I agree with the Rand colleagues who I quoted earlier. I think Putin's gone all in. He's determined to continue through the winter, hoping that the Ukrainian army and people will falter and that pressure will grow in the West to pressure Zelensky to stop the war. In his speech to the, at the Kremlin on September 30th, when he announced the annexation of the war Oblast, Putin said, We call on the Kiev regime to immediately cease fire, all hostility, to a war that it unleashed back in 2014. They should return to the negotiating table. We, Russia, are ready for this. It's been said more than once. But we will not discuss the choice of the people in Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson. That decision has been made. Russia will not destroy them, betray them. Clearly, that position is a non starter for the Ukrainians. Uh, the Ukrainians aren't going to negotiate if the land Russia seized since February 14th is off the table. Uh, Zelensky, I think, made that clear on October 4th when he signed a decree which ruled out negotiations with Putin. He said Ukraine is ready for dialogue, but with, quote, another president of Russia. Ukrainians also know from Russia's invasion of Georgia in 2008 that Russian ceasefires have a way of turning permanent. Russia doesn't honor its commitments and simply maintains control of seized land. So the conflict's stalemate. It's entered a new dangerous phase. Putin's increasingly cornered. He's in the box. He's losing ground in Ukraine, facing mounting criticism at home. His one weapon are these horrible missiles and drones that come raining down on innocent civilians in Ukraine. I think looking to the future, even if there was a way to begin negotiations, I suspect it would be a very hard grind. It will be difficult for the hardline Russian elites who support Putin to reclaim it drive to reclaim empire to countenance any failure or any compromise. And even if Putin isn't the Russian leader, if something happens and he is replaced, I expect that the legacy of Putinism, of Russian post-imperialism, will endure and limit, at least initially, any new Russian leader's options. In Ukraine, it will be equally hard for the Ukrainian people, after all of the suffering, all of the family members who have been killed, to accept any kind of territorial compromise. And after the fighting stops, we and our allies are going to have to decide what kind of relationship we want with Russia and how we will try to build, rebuild an enduring international order. I think we'll be shot the subject for the next speech from Chomsky. All right, so let me come to a close with an expression of hope. We need some hope at the end of what I'm sure has been a depressing presentation for you, but it's the best I can do. It's the accurate one. It's what many of my friends have the same. 2015, Arkady Ostrovsky 
Russia editor of The Economist published a book entitled The Invention of Russia from Gorbachev's Freedom to Putin's War. It was a brilliant account of the course of modern Russia, focused on both policy and the media in the later Soviet period and in the post Soviet decade. In his concluding chapter, Ostrovsky puts Vladimir Putin squarely in the Russian historical tradition of using aggression and territorial expansion as a form of defense against modernization, war versus modernization. In an almost prophetic summary of Putin's approach, this was written in the year, published in the year after Putin invaded Crimea, and seven years before Putin launched this invasion this past February. Ostrovsky wrote, and here I'm going to read you a quote, Putin has portrayed himself as a gatherer of Russian lands and a restorer of the Russian Empire. In fact, he is likely to go down in history as its grave digger. Putin offered war as an alternative to modernity in the future. The forces he awakened are the forces not of imperial expansion. Russia does not possess the energy or the vision required for empire building, but of revisionism, of chaos, and of war. He may plunge the country into darkness, or Russia may yet rid itself of this post-imperial syndrome and emerge Tragic, this tragic war should have taught Putin and the Russian people anything. It's that using military force, especially a military with such serious deficiencies, really has its limits when faced by, faced by a people fighting an inspired battle to save their country. War isn't a substitute for the hard work of modernization. You need to focus on adopting sensible economic reforms, diversifying your economy, preparing your young people to compete in a competitive Instead, Putin has mortgaged Russia's future to satisfy his imperialistic dreams. Alexei Navalny, the Russian opposition leader who's now in prison, wrote an article in the Washington Post on September 30th, in which he argued that Russia, the future of Russia, should become a central issue now for discussion. Navalny argues in favor of Russia becoming a parliamentary republic because he thinks that's the form of government that will be the most successful model we're actually modernizing the Russian nation. I think we're a long way from that, but Navalny's framed the issue, which I think Russians are eventually going to have to confront. The current model simply isn't working. It's causing too much suffering abroad and certainly at home. John McLaughlin recently recalled that he accompanied then CIA director William Webster to West Germany in October 1989. The German government and intelligence officials whom they met at that time could not Bothman said, even conceive of a reunified Germany in the end of the Cold War. One month later, the Berlin Wall fell and the process of reunification started. Recall, McLaughlin recalls this famous saying of the physicist Niels Bohr, who said, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> McLaughlin's lesson is that we need to start thinking now about the future, because world-shaking events may be on us upon us sooner than we think. He wants to avoid looking back and wondering how we could have possibly missed what was coming. So I'll readily admit to you that I don't have everything thought out. I'm trying to do some serious thinking. A lot of other analysts in Washington are doing this in the government and outside. But since I've used up all my time, that too will be have to be the subject for my next speech. <laughs> so let's, uh, let me close by saying I hope this war comes to an end soon on terms that will ensure Ukraine's future, will ensure the stability that it will stop the killing, and then we can build, begin building a safer future for Ukraine, for Russia, for the world. Thanks very much for listening.